So the title of my thesis is Screw Everything, Make It Better. And I got it printed as a book. It's not published as a book. It's just printed as a book. <coughs> and I'm going to struggle to try and condense the 200 pages into 20 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. So here we go. I want to talk about revolution and cynicism and apathy and nihilism and hopelessness, you know, to kind of counteract all the cheerful Greeks we just heard about. <laughs> I'm going to begin with a story. Uh, a few weeks ago during the election, I was sick like I think a lot of people are, of the embarrassingly low level of political debate and the name calling, and I call it childish behavior, but that's insulting to children. <laughs> And so I got this idea to kind of try and organize all candidate forms for the two St. John's writings, to try and get the candidates in a room to get them to talk about something other than, you know, how stupid the other one is. And we were trying to organize it to set it up as kind of a job interview to ask some questions about themselves and their philosophies and things. <coughs> and so while I was trying to get these organized and try to find people to help, it was suggested to me to email some of the more, you know, young and hip political science profs at Mun. And so I emailed, I think, five or six of them. They all said no. Uh, but they, for the most part, they were sympathetic to my plight, and they uh, wished me luck. Except one professor, he uh, wasn't so hopeful. He said, uh, you know, good luck. It's never going to happen. They're never going to talk about anything meaningful or useful or any ideas are just going to name call and be bitter and angry and nasty about it. And he said trying to get them to talk nice to each other about real things would be like hurting cats. And so that's the kind of cynicism that I, I hope that my thesis gets at and, and tries to provide an answer to how we can overcome that. Because that cynicism that the Professor exemplifies is an acceptance of the status quo. The status quo is something that's inevitable and unchangeable, and we just have to accept that politicians are going to be mean and nasty and not talk about anything meaningful. That's just the way it is. There's nothing we can do to change that. And that cynicism, it's a loss of hope. It's a loss of hope that things can get better. And so what does this loss of hope mean? What does hope mean? One of the heroes of this uh, piece is Václav Havel, he's a guy scratching his head, you can watch for him, flipping by. <coughs> uh, he was, if, if you don't know, he, he's an absurdist Czech playwright who wrote these really ridiculous plays about crazy stuff. And when the Soviets invaded in 1968, shortly after his work got banned, and he became very outspoken against the regime and became a leading dissident and wrote some really important essays. And then uh, he spent most of the 80s in prison as a political prisoner. He got out around 1986, and then by Christmas of 1989, he was president of the Democratic Czech Republic. He had led a Bell Revolution. Not bad for an absurdist playwright. And so he uh, was asked in an interview in 1986 uh, if he saw any hope in his situation, if there was any hope of anything changing, because the communist regime had been you know, going strong for 30 years, and it had been almost 20 years since the Soviets invaded and instituted a policy called normalization, which is this terrible, it's as creepy as it sounds, you know, to try and keep everybody normalized. And he was asked if there was hope in his situation, and he said, hope is not prognostication, it's an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. It's not the same thing, he said, as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out for the best, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. And that's important, that certainty that something will turn, will make sense regardless of how it turns out. And that's what this loss of hope is, this, this cynicism, this is the loss of that certainty that something makes sense. And it's a lot, and it's based, I think, on our, on our loss of our ability to make sense, to make meaning, to act meaningfully. And so how did this happen? When did we lose this ability all of a sudden to make sense, to have hope that things would get better? And I say the culprit is postmodernity. There's a lot of different sort of definitions of postmodernity and people throw it around for all different things, but the definition I like this best is Jean-Francois Lyotard's definition, 
<laughs> he called postmodernity an incredulity towards meta narratives, which is kind of a fancy way of saying it's suspicion or skepticism or rejection of these grand ideas and stories and myths that kind of create a cohesive idea of society, like, which give our, our communities and our cultures a sense of, of meaning. Examples of these are God or communism or capitalism, these grand things which we can, you know, act meaningfully based upon the meaning that they give us. And so postmodernity is, it, it comes along, it doesn't come along, but it's a, a gradual recognition that these things don't hold up anymore, that these aren't actually true, these stories. And so it begins to undermine these and reject these, these big ideas and these big stories. But it's a problem if we take this as an end, if we take these stories to be the end of the story and nothing is left. But I see postmodernity more as a, as a beginning, as a challenge. It's a, it's a fork in the road. And, and we're, we come to a point where we're facing a crisis in meaning, a crisis in our ability to make sense and to create value. And what this is, is it's an ethical or moral crisis. Morals and ethics is, I think, the most basic way you can define them. And I talked about in here a little bit of the difference between them, but I'm just going to skip all of that and just boil it right down to morals and ethics is doing and good. It, it, it combines action and striving towards some idea of what is good. But to do this, you need some idea of what good is. You need some firm ground that you can stand on and define what good is and what, how you're going to go about striving for it. There needs to be some transcendent meaning from which we can base the meaning of good. If you can't say whether something is good or not, how can you do good? So how do we go about discovering the ground to give value to something, to say it's good or bad or better or worse? This depends on our ability to make sense and how do we rediscover this and how do we rediscover our ability to make meaning and to understand and to restore this value. With stories and ideas losing their ability to hold things together and they lose their ability to be the ground that we make sense from, what are we left with? Uh, Dostoevsky and brothers Karamazov wrote that without God, everything is permitted. But then that begs the question, without God, how is anything permitted? Without some transcendent big idea holding it all together, how can we do anything? How can we do anything meaningful? But the thing to remember and to make note of is that when our stories and ideas lose their, their meaning, when they no longer allow us to make sense, that we don't cease to exist. We don't stop living. We continue on. We remain and all our stuff remains. Life goes on with or without a God to give us meaning. So what is left for us to stand on? What remains? We do. The story that the community might have used to give itself meaning may be gone, but the community remains. We're all still here. We're all still living our lives, whether, you know, God is giving a meaning or the party is giving a meaning or whatever else. What remains is this complex network of relationships between myself, others, and things. This ground that we can make meaning from is this complex relationship, this complex network of relationships that we're all interconnected and intertwined. And this is kind of a perilous concept, I think, to work with because it's, it quite easily can slip off the edge into some sort of flaky new ageism. Of, you know, we're all happily holding hands and playing around the rosy, but it's not quite that simple. And I. I, I lean a lot in here on the, the philosophy of, of Emmanuel Levinas, who talks about the importance of that encounter for, for, being, for helping us create that ground from which we can make meaning. So before I use stories, ideas to make sense, or to make meaning, I am here, you are here. Before there's meaning at all, there's an encounter between you and I. In fact, before there's me, there's a you. I encounter you, and by encountering you, I am able to come up with an identity of who I am. My relationship to you gives me my self-identity and it gives me my humanity. And in this way I'm vulnerable to you, I'm dependent upon you for myself. And it also means that I'm responsible to you and for you, and vice versa. And so this connection and this responsibility we have to one another 
becomes an ethics of responsibility to the other, which Levinas argues, and I am inclined to agree, that it's what exists before all else does. Before we know, before we think, therefore I am, or before we were being, we exist in relation to one another. So this doing part of ethics that I talked about, the doing good, is tending to, with care and sensitivity to these networks of relationships that we're a part of with others and things as we go about navigating our world. And so the good becomes tending to these relationships better. So the good is no longer, you know, something that Plato would call a perfect form or Aristotle would call some virtuous um, golden mean or even Kant would call some sort of rational principle that can be, you know, worked out rationally or utilitarians the idea of the greatest good for the greatest number. It's not that anymore, it's simply better. What is good is something that is better than what is worse. And so it's something that's always unfolding, it's never fixed, it's always, we can always do better, we can always make things better. And making things better is a matter of, of making sense. By tending to these relationships of under, and by understanding our place in this complex network, we're able to make sense again. We're able to restore moral value. We're able to restore hopes and dreams. In the Screw Everything, Make It Better, there's a long explanation of how we understand better and how we're able to understand better, which allows us to, to increasingly act and make things better, which I call the hermeneutic screw, which is where the screw comes from. That and sex appeal. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to go into that. So, so what does this mean for us here and now? If we want to make things better, if we want to accept our responsibility to others in our community, which we don't have to. You know, you have a responsibility to feed your goldfish, but you don't have to. Your goldfish is just going to die. So, we have a choice in the matter, but if we want to accept this responsibility and make things better, it's a matter of making sense in the complex web of relationships that we're all in. And acting within our immediate circumstances to turn that increasingly better understanding into an increasingly better world. And this is where the revolutionary part of it comes in. The revolutionary potential for this idea lies in the idea that revolution is not one seismic event that changes everything, but rather it's a culmination of a million little things which over time change everything. And at some point somebody puts a tag on it that says that was revolutionary, but you know, while you're in it, it's a million little tiny things that are going on. And Vatsalat Pothel calls these, these million little things living in truth. And living in truth is not, you know, accepting God's version of truth and trying to live up to that. It's a simple refusal to accept the status quo as inevitable. It's a refusal to let cynicism and apathy and nihilism creep in and blind us. It's a refusal to lose hope. So in the end, the candidate events didn't happen because of scheduling conflicts and the conservatives don't like talking to people. <laughs> but we were able to adapt and we did interviews, we filmed interviews instead. And so with four out of six candidates, we were, or seven candidates, sorry, we were able to sit down with them and ask them serious questions about real things. And for the most part, they answered them. And I think looking back at those interviews, they're on the Scopes website if you guys want to take a look. Um, I know you don't want anything to do with politics right now, probably, sort of inundated with it. But I think they were successful in getting these candidates to talk about things unusual or to get them to talk about themselves. And when it wasn't successful, it said a lot about the candidates. We asked Jack Harris um, what he'd like to hear, if there's a God, what he'd like to hear God say to him at the pearly the gates, and he was dumbfounded. He kind of staggered around and said, I don't know, and walked away. But that tells you something about Jack Harris. <laughs> And so, I'm, I'm happy with how those interviews turned out because it kind of was a, look at this cynical philosophy, <coughs> that these are real people and if we ask them real questions, we can have a real conversation with them. And sure, there's a lot of other things that we have to get through and work through and it's always ongoing and it's always something that we have to do, but hope isn't lost. Cynicism doesn't have to rule the day, the status quo isn't unchangeable. And so that, in a nutshell, is what Screw Everything Make It Better is about. So, thank you. <laughs>